Angel is brought to you by Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point of just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash angel for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. And LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel to get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis and we're here in Sydney, in Australia for the Launch Festival Sydney. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we've been doing Launch Festival Sydney here uh, for two years and we found three companies last year to invest in and hopefully this year we'll find a couple more. And I thought with the Angel Podcast, we would try to find some of the most influential investors in Sydney. And when you ask people who their favorite investor is or who's doing a great job, Samantha Wong comes up over and over and over again. Uh, we met last year. We uh, did. We had a nice dinner. Yeah, at, it was wonderful. Uh, Benelong? Yes, yeah, Sydney Opera House. Sydney Opera House. Thank the acoustics you. are terrible. Food was great. Conversation was pretty good, too. Conversation not bad. We had Scott yeah. from Atlassian right. and a, it was a bunch fun of night. folks. Um, you are a partner at Blackbird Ventures. Yes. Which I believe is one of the top. There's three major VC firms here, from what I understand. There's a fourth since I think you came. Okay, yeah. so run me down the four. Yeah, so uh, Blackbird, I think we were the first in, in, in this new wave of VC in Australia. Yeah. So we got started in 2012. Great. Airtree, Squarepeg. Yep. Um, and the fourth that is probably new to you is, is Main Sequence Ventures, which is a deep tech. Got fund. it. Yeah. So here, uh, and then Atlassian, from what I understand, the most successful company in the history. Am I, I think correct? that's correct, yeah. Because they're worth $30 billion now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's extraordinary. Yes. Um, Atlassian is a major LP, or were they the co-founders of Blackbird? Explain that relationship. Yeah, so um, very tight relationship. Uh, Mike and Scott were both foundational LPs in Great. Blackbird. Mike was actually also on the investment committee orig originally. Great. Um, and um, really, the Blackbird is a founders fund. So it was not just Mike and Scott, but it was founders around 97 um, from all of the major tech companies that came out at Australia. So AConnex, Campaign Monitor, Redbubble, et cetera. Fantastic. Um, all pooling their capital and their expertise to help the next generation. And how did you wind up becoming an investor? What was your background? Yeah, so um, like most VCs, kind of pretty atypical. I actually started my career as a lawyer, um, but I always kind of did stuff on the side. My, my parents were from technology originally, and eventually it kind of all came came back to me. I became a product manager in an e-commerce startup called surfstitch.com, which at, at one point was the world's largest action sports retailer. This is kind of like the early uh, tens uh, yeah. kind of era. The aughts? Or no, the 2010 Late era. aughts, early, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what do we call the tens? The teens? Like, teens, yeah, tens? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I'm I don't not, know. I know the aughts. It took me a decade yeah. to figure that out. Yeah, just after the aughts. Then. Also, so after aughts, yeah. before the roaring 20s, <laughs> yeah, yes, which exactly. is, we're almost upon us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so you're working as a product manager. Correct. Previously a lawyer. Did you start up law or you just did corporate law? Or? No, no. I, the, yeah, I did like big M&A, public M&A. Oh, then great background. Litigation then. stuff. Yeah, like not at all relevant to yeah. being a product manager. Soul crushing? Um, Did you enjoy it? Yeah, like I actually really enjoyed it. Like I, I really love the people. I love the intellectual challenge. It just wasn't that creative and it was kind of like all the fun stuff happened before it landed on your desk. Yeah. Um, and I just had a fascination with things that were happening online and mm. yeah, it, it just felt natural to step out. So how do you wind up going from... I get lawyer to product manager, you wanted to be on the other side of the table. Sure. How, how did you make the jump? Did you get recruited to be in VC? No, uh, I'm, I don't think anyone in Australia gets recruited to, to yeah. be in VC. I started a company um, that went through an accelerator that Blackbird runs called Startmate. Yeah. Um, super, um, it was a, a services marketplace, a professional services marketplace. Oh. Um, and, you know, got really close to Nikki and Rick through that process. Um, and when I was sort of between startups uh, after Startmate, um, they were also sort of hiring their first hire, uh, raising their first kind of big fund. The first one was a 30 mil fund and the second was a 200 mil fund. So quite a big yeah. step up. And they had a little bit of... Uh, uh, a little management fee to keep the lights on like, with. Can we and, hire yeah, smart here? Yeah. Um, and, and so I joined the Blackbird team in 2015. Fantastic. Yeah. And Smartmate is an... Startmate. Startmate, I'm yeah. sorry, is a accelerator here. My understanding is you Correct. put 75K in for 7% or something? 7.5%. 7.5%. If they haven't raised a round. So we'll also match valuations if they've, if they've raised something beforehand. Got it. And 
how many companies have gone through Start Mate? Uh, I think it's around 100 now. Oh, we, wow. we, we run two batches a year. It's been going since 2011. Uh, each batch is usually around 12 to 15 companies these days. So um, we, we definitely see a lot of volume at that really early stage. The thing I've been impressed with in my time in Australia the last two years and having made a couple of investments here is the founders here uh, are ambitious. They want to build global companies. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the spirit of the of entrepreneurs here in sure. Australia. Um, I would say in 2011, um, you, you would have said the opposite, that, ah. the, that the ambition was a bit dampened, mm. that people were only thinking about building local businesses or copycat businesses, you know, taking you know, Uber or Airbnb for the US and trying to apply it to Australia. I think really um, since about 2015 when, and, and onwards, that era when Atlassian IPO'd, Canva sort of became a unicorn, et cetera, um, it's really turned the light bulb on in people's minds as to, oh, hold on, I can actually build a really big global company, a thirty billion billion dollar company here from Australia and so um, and that's great because yeah. we don't have a very big country and if you just build for Australia you're never going to build a really big About 30 business. million people here yeah size of Texas you know it's yeah, just, yeah. It's, a, it's a tiny market yeah and I recently had the founder of Canva on the podcast yeah. she finally was able to uh, come on the podcast she's, yes. a, she's a bit <laughs> of a uh, she's a, don't take it personally. She doesn't do many podcasts. She doesn't interviews. do anything. Like, you told me, like, yeah, you guys yeah. are investors. It's hard to get Melanie to come out yeah. to do anything. She's but just work. super focused on yeah. building a great business and a great product. So impressed. When did you first meet her? And and were you early investors in her at Blackbird? Or? Yeah. So um, Blackbird was has been involved in in every round since the very beginning. The oh, wow. first check was a two hundred and fifty k check. Um, it was literally the first investment out of the Blackbird first fund. Actually, they. Um, held open their round to allow Blackbird to invest because we hadn't actually had our first close. Um, at, so, at with that the point. first fund, Blackbird hit the unicorn of unicorns in Australia. Uh, yes, yeah, because yeah, that last year predated. Oh yeah, the fund. So yeah, absolutely. You hit the 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 biggest uh, yeah. win with the first investment. That's amazing. Yeah, and look, that first fund, to be honest, is just looking pretty amazing because even as, even if we took Canva out, it would be a top decile fun globally wow um it yeah so do you invest primarily in australia or are you open to investments in other regions and if so what regions um good question um it as blackbird's mission is definitely to back australia's most ambitious founders so we'd always need to see a connection with australia not necessarily building here about a quarter of our portfolio are in silicon valley or somewhere else where it makes sense to build that company over the last two years we've also put about 10 million dollars into new zealand companies oh, really? and we are seeing phenomenal quality uh in new zealand at the early stages and so we definitely want to ramp up our investing there too is there an advantage to being here and outside of the madness of Silicon Valley <laughs> in terms of an ability to focus, um, or is it super challenging because of the talent issues? How um, do you look at that and advise your company? Yeah, um, I'd say you can actually have the best of both worlds. So Silicon Valley has become incredibly competitive for labor and talent generally. I mean, I don't need to tell you that. Yeah. Um, in general, they are cheaper and more loyal here in Australia, but um, just as talented from a you know a technical perspective, um, and and easier to hire and retain. Obviously, um, I would say there is capital here now. Previously, you had to go to Silicon Valley if you wanted to raise you know more than a million dollars, basically. Mm. Um, that's not true anymore. Um, so I think uh, there, there are more reasons to start and stay here to some degree. The exception to that is eventually most people find they need to hire sales and marketing folks who have those networks in, in, in the US and Silicon course, Valley. Yeah. Um, and But that can often be done as a satellite office or just a, as, a, as a branch office. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's time difference issues where when you're in sales, yeah. you're going to be picking up the phone or perhaps having lunch sure. with somebody. That's not going to work remote. No. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Or it's not going to work from here. It will work remote having workers there. Sure. Hey, when we get back from this quick break, I want to talk about valuations. Sure. My understanding is valuations here are yum yum, very <laughs> reasonable. I want to know exactly what investors can expect in terms of valuations here uh, at the seed stage, pre-product market fit and post-product market fit. And when we get back on Angel Podcast. 
Scaling sales is so hard, you know that, but it's so essential. You need to scale your sales process, your team, and of course your software. You know Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management platform also known as CRM. And now with Salesforce Essentials, you get easy, out-of-the-box tools and support at a startup price point, and that's critical. Here are the benefits. You're gonna get set up instantly, and you can easily scale your sales team by customizing with clicks. You don't need to write any code. You will get simple integrations that connect and integrate all of your data under one roof. And you'll have full cycle customer support. So you can automatically connect multiple support channels. You'll be able to automate busy work and repetitive tasks so you're not wasting your time. And customers can help themselves, of course, with a self-service support site. Everything you need is on one screen so you can track emails, calls, and meetings from your inbox. Get access to the world's number one CRM at a cost fit for a startup. Go to salesforce.com angel and you will get a 50% discount with an annual contract and you'll get a free onboard training session. So go to salesforce.com slash angel and get that 50% discount right now. Hey everybody, welcome back to Angel, the podcast. You can visit the podcast at Angel Podcast. If you do a search in your favorite podcast player for Angel, you will not find us. You will find a bunch of Christians talking about <laughs> angels in their lives, uh, which is also a great podcast to listen to if you're so inclined. Uh, but if you type Angel and my last name, Calacanis, you will find it eventually, or just go to Angel Podcast. Uh, this is our third season, thanks to our partners for making it possible. Every time we get a couple of partners set up, we do a new uh, season of 10 episodes, and this has been our third season. It's gone really well. I'm delighted to have Samantha Wong, goes by Sam, uh, here in the community. And you can follow her on the Twitter, Hala Sammy, yep, H-O-L-A-S-A-M-M-Y. And she's a partner at Blackbird ventures. Uh, you can find them on the internet, blackbird.vc. So let's talk about valuations. Sure. Obviously, Australian dollars are 75 cents on the dollar. Yep. So that's great for American investors and LPs. Sure. And my understanding is average valuation, pre-product market fit, 2 million, maybe product market fit, a couple of customers, product to market, three, four, five million. Am I, am I in the ballpark? Australian I think dollars? those averages would, would, would probably hold up. I think there are always exceptions, right, for, you know, star founders or, or, or super amazing teams. Um, uh, yeah, but, but broadly, you're right. And so what does an, a seed round look like in Australia? Um, so when it comes together, what are, what are the broad strokes, the amount of money, how long does it last people, yeah. and, and who's leading these rounds and, and filling in the rounds? How, yeah, does, it, sure. how does it go down? Um, so I think, I mean, the physics of, of it is very similar to what you'd see in Silicon Valley. So people are generally giving away around 15, 20% of their company for that first round. Um, it might be somewhere between one to 1 1.5 mil um, that they're raising, um, maybe a little less, a little more, depending if it's, you know, software versus hardware etc um and, and and yeah and that that's kind of the stock standard sort of a four to five mil valuation um for that's that seed round i would say though um the best companies that we've invested in at seed stage canva included um were always exceeding the market in terms Eight, of nine, the, 10 million uh, yeah double, uh, yeah, basically. yeah 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 and you can how do you personally get a sense and get comfortable with that higher valuation and how do you know now, because you've been doing this for, I think, five years, six years, do you have a spidey sense? Do you have a gut for, hey, this is something special. I'm going to maybe look at the valuation slightly differently. I think um, at the very early stages that we're investing in, sort of pre-seed, seed, seed um, I just need to believe, can they catch, can they make the unit of progress they need to, to unlock the next round of funding mm. um, and raise at a higher valuation than I'm paying now? And if I don't believe that, I should, it's not about, I should just walk away. Mm. Um, often I think um, valuation is a way to test your conviction around your whole thesis around, around the investment. As the investor? Yes. And so... If you're looking at it saying, hey, we're going to spend a million and a half dollars, uh, a milli, I guess you guys call it a mil. <laughs> yeah, a mil. <laughs> a mil. You put 1.5 mil in for 20% of the company, 30% of the company, 15% of the company, whatever it is. You really have to start thinking, can they get to that next level, which would be maybe a Series A or a, a second seed yeah. round 
for $3 million yeah. at a $15 million cap. And what would that look like? Yeah, exactly. So you're thinking about the next round when you're doing this round. Yes. What does a company have to achieve here in Australia? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's different than the U.S. In order to unlock a Series A today. 2019, we're here having this discussion. Yeah, I, well, I think it depends which Series A you're talking about as well. So okay. we have this phenomenon of the Australian Series A. Oh, explain what that is. Um, so it's an Australian Series A is probably like a three to four mil round. Well, that's like the classic Silicon Valley Series A from yeah. just 10 years ago. Yeah, not, not that long Sequoia ago. Sequoia would right. put three million. They put three million into Mahalo for 20 odd percent yep. at, a, I think, 11 or $12 million post. That was a standard Series A. Yeah, so so I'd say we're stuck in ten years in the past, maybe in terminology yeah. um, stages. But um, so I would say to get to that level of milestone, you've got to have a, a product out in market, some demonstration of customer love, maybe not revenue, but really amazing engagement up and to the right, that that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and then at that point, you know, you'd probably raise, you know, that three, four mil round, um, which would get you to the next uh, funding milestone, which is when the US Series A would, would typically happen. And that would be that like that eight, eight mil plus round. For 20%, which yeah. then yeah. if you start thinking about that, it, it would be five times eight is about yep. 35, 45 million, something yep. in that range, Correct. which used to be what Series B used to be. Yes. And so that what <laughs> we're seeing here is this sort of classic A here, which is a function in the United States, at least, of larger fund sizes. Yes. When you've got an $800 million or $600 million fund, boy, do you need to make write bigger checks. Yeah, it's absolutely. Just, you can't and do... ownership is very important. Yep. Yeah. Do you have that sharp elbowed ownership concept here where... VCs, you have these big four now, are trying to compete with each other or does it feel more collaborative at this moment in time? Um, Co-leading, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing is with, with only three or four uh, large size funds is we all actually have quite different mandates. Mm. So uh, we will only look at things that are global from day one. Um, we have a preference from, for bottom-up sales processes rather than enterprise sales processes. Um, about 50% of our investments are deep tech. Some people won't touch deep tech. Some people won't touch pre-series Bs. So so we don't find ourselves bumping up against local firms all that often, um, which is great because we love to take sort of 75%-ish of the seed and, and maybe the Australian Series A round, fill out the rest with our co-investors from our LP base, like Mike and Scott from Atlassian and, and, and other oh. folks in, in the community. Um, and, and value added uh, people who might yeah. add a little bit to mentoring the founder. Yeah. I mean, we're founded on this idea of founders helping founders mm. and, you know, getting that skin in the game is, is one way of, of helping do that. You mentioned bottom up versus enterprise sales. What does this mean? So, um, when, when we talk about bottom up sales, we're talking about, um, typically, uh, products that can be discovered organically or with a very, uh, low touch. So, mm. uh, maybe it's through online advertising or, or, or SEO, something like that. Um, the user experiences the product on a free trial or something of that nature, punches in their credit cards and upgrades to, to a paid, um, account, and then hopefully virally spreads it through their organization or their community or what have you, and expands into a large account through that contrast that with an enterprise sale whereby you have a bunch of people kind of doing maybe outbound email um, cultivating leads uh, scoring them and then you know maybe you know on the high end of the side steak lunches yeah. you know a few times until you close the deal on the lower side you know demos presentations etc and I guess that comes from your canva DNA having watched canva you know, people just say, I need to make a, a wedding invite or I need to make a flyer or I need to make a web page and Canva comes up in a Google search or in a SEM, a search engine yeah. ad. Um, they try it. They upgrade to nine ninety five a month. <laughs> but then eventually eight people in the company start using Correct. it and then a sales executive says, oh, we're at eight people at IBM or 80 people. Yeah. Maybe we'll make a phone call. I think they have one <clears throat> salesperson now. So it's not yeah. even someone making a phone call. It's just, it's it's even like lower touch than that. But um, the Canva is actually a realization of a hypothesis that preceded Canva. Mm -hmm. And it was really around Atlassian. Mm -hmm. Atlassian, you know, were the first in the market to have this idea, you know, we'll just build the best software. Mm -hmm. We'll make it so cheap that, uh, you know, uh, dev t team leaders anywhere around the world can bung their credit card in and expense it. 
um, and eventually it'll grow through the engineering teams and 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 suddenly we'll have you know a reasonably big account on our hands so they kind of originated that model um and the beauty about that model is it doesn't matter that you're in sydney you could be you could be anywhere you could yeah. be building that business from literally anywhere um so it's no disadvantage to not be in silicon valley and that's where we sort of you know one of the foundational theses around so Blackbird. you saw that up close and personal and said hey i wonder if other businesses could do that and in fact Atlassian used to have a product called HipChat, yeah. which was the embodiment of that, and Slack stole this exact, or was inspired by, <laughs> yeah. it, um, if you want to be generous. Uh, but they stole this exact model, which was, hey, yeah, just buy it, and eventually, if you want to upgrade, there's a couple of features that you might like, like getting past 10000 in your archive, $7. And Atlassian eventually sold HipChat to Slack, I believe, yeah. to consolidate the market and get a little bit of exposure there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there are other examples in our portfolio that kind of follow that very similar uh, trend. There's a, com a company called Safety Culture, which mm. is a safety and quality inspection software platform. Similar thing, like there's someone out in the field, you know, having to complete these paper-based uh, checklists. They go onto the app store, they find the iAuditor app, download it. Realize What's that one called? iAuditor? Uh, iAuditor is the product name. Safety ah, Culture is the it. is the company name. Oh. Um, so Tiger just just led their their last their last round, but um, uh, also a really awesome company and similar thing. Uh, people downloading these free apps from the app store suddenly managers are receiving these emailed PDFs from the iOrder app. They want to consolidate it and get have analytics. the management tools exactly and, better yeah. security and whatnot. And suddenly yeah, you've got a up. you know uh, many hundred seat kind of account on your hands. Yeah, it's such a brilliant model too because what you're saying is let's undercharge for the product. And Melanie talked about this a lot on uh, when she was on this week yeah. in startups. Um, you know, they didn't raise the prices. They, they have some additional products that you sure. can buy to get extra value and play team player mode, but they want to just have everybody using it. It's a really different mindset than uh, software before that time frame, whether it's cloud-based or not, where you know, you're trying to maximize your profit per user. Here you're explicitly saying, let's minimize the profit per user and get more users. And in the age of data, Oh boy, is that an advantage when you become the standard and you have all the data from that large user base? Yeah, I mean, there's that, and then also you expand the market. Mm. Um, you know, seven or eight years ago, when when you know Canva got started, uh, the market of graphic designers probably didn't look that exciting. Right. But the insight that that Mel and Cliff and Cam had is that actually everybody wants to create beautiful designs; they just don't have the skill. Mm. If we can make a good enough product so that they can have you know, can create products of that, of that quality um, and make it cheap enough that no one even thinks about how much it costs, yeah. suddenly the market is many orders of magnitude bigger. Yeah, just like Uber said, hey, the original Absolutely. tagline was everybody has a private driver. Yeah. And the concept of Travis's original idea was like, wouldn't you love to have your own driver? That was like an elite concept yeah. that somebody would come pick you up and take you somewhere and you sit in the back and just mellow out and read a book or check yeah. your email everybody's private driver. How do you do that? Well, you have to lower the cost in order to expand the pool of potential yeah, absolutely. users. And, and, and anybody can be a chauffeur as well as... Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned deep tech. Sure. Explain some of your investments there in deep tech and how you evaluate deep tech when there's so little to go on because unlike Canva, Atlassian, or your checklist company, Gosh, you know, they have some data to look at. They have some early user data with, with deep tech. You don't have that data to go on and you have to make a decision as an investor. So answer that question when we get back on the Angel Podcast. Hiring is always hard and it's getting really hard today because we've got unemployment at historic lows. Also, many people just throw a job posting out there. They put it on their job board or some random message board or dump it in your Slack room. That's not going to work. It's not going to work, but what is going to work is to go ahead and use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where 610 million members visit, and they do that to make connections, learn, and grow as professionals, and sometimes they're looking to discover new job opportunities, or sometimes they're passive job seekers, and that is the secret. Not everybody's going to a job board every day looking for jobs, but LinkedIn will present opportunities to those hundreds of millions of LinkedIn users. And here's how easy it is. You just simply go to LinkedIn and it's really easy because you say where you're looking for the person, you put in your job 
you can then look for what experiences you want them to have. How many years of marketing, you set a budget, boom. It's up and running and you will find somebody quickly. How do I know this? Because we found two of our 15 team members on LinkedIn very recently. Sir Charles, our new director, and our marketing manager, Maureen. You can create these job listings quickly and easily and to get $50 off right now, a fitty, okay? Five O for your first job posting. Go to linkedin.com slash angel, A-N-G-E-L. You know how to spell angel. That's linkedin.com slash angel, and you will get $50 off your first job posting. Terms and conditions apply, of course. Now, let's get back to this amazing podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Angel, the podcast, angelpodcast.com. And you can follow me. I'm Jason Calacanis, angel investor in the United States, but I'm here in Sydney for a launch festival, sydney.com. We've done it the last two years, and we'll see. We may come back for a third (laughs) and fourth. We'll have to negotiate with the New South Wales government, but they've been so amazing to us. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, at Jason. I'm showing off, correct? Um, <laughs> or if you still have a Tumblr account and they still have that website up, I'm Tumblr. Dot, I'm Jason.tumblr.com. Uh, I do not have a TikTok account. Are you on the TikTok? Like the oh, kids my here? dad t- was, t- was talking to me about TikTok yesterday, which I think is a little weird. But <laughs> wow. Is that, was, he, was it a dad joke? Was he doing like a dad joke that he opened a TikTok <laughs> account to embarrass you? I hope not. <laughs> now that I'm a dad, my nine-year-old, London, I... Uh, when I take her to like school events mm-hmm. and stuff like that, I'm like, do you want me to dance for your friends? <laughs> and dad, do not embarrass, embarrass me. me. I was like, well, I have some new moves <laughs> and I know that you're having this talent contest. So I talked to your teacher and she said that they're going to have a dad competition. I'll be the only person. So I'm <laughs> going to win. She's like, no, they didn't. I'm like, no, they did. <laughs> so I'm getting, I'm getting all my dad jokes. You got to get your mom jokes ready. Okay. Uh, and thanks for doing it. You're uh, for people who are not listening. You're, you're eight months in. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you're pretty hard working here, <laughs> podcasts and everything. Hey, when uh, we left uh, our hero, that's you, uh, I want to talk about deep tech. A lot of people have given up on investing in deep tech and are focused on, hey, CAC, LTV, you know, show me your metrics. Great. Let's get your Leave segment for out. us. <laughs> yeah. So take me through how you evaluate deep tech and how you think about how long it's going to take to commercialize and how you fund those companies. Because it is... I think, a distinctly different funding model. Am I correct? Well, I guess that's where we would draw the line on what we would invest in and what we wouldn't Okay. uh, when it comes to deep tech. So typically what we're trying to do is, so we've called it science nonfiction rather than deep tech internally. And so what we mean by- Science nonfiction. I love it. (laughs) And so what we mean by that is like, you know, at, at, you know, superficial first glance, it looks like something that's kind of crazy, it belongs in a PhD program or something like that. But if you actually kind of look under the hood, it's really achievable on sort of one to two rounds of capital, much like a software company is. No one's okay. really getting to a mil ARR, you know, a significant proof point in software these days without, you know, you know, four or five mil raised sure. pretty much um and in in deep tech you can also um, f- find these companies who are able to kind of get distinct proof points uh in one to two uh rounds of of capital so an example might be uh, we have a lidar company called baraha um that we invested in you know, in their first round and and onwards that first round was really about taking a demonstration of the product which is sort of table sized mm. making it tissue box sized and selling it to uh an early access program to um, early customers in the autonomous vehicle space. Wow. Um, and they could do that on basically a couple of million dollars. Um, but they had built that box, what, at a university or in their garage? No, I mean, the guys like did it part time. It took them, you know, they quit their Sweat jobs equity. three months, yeah. you know, three months. I think a friend put in 100K on a convertible note to help mm. literally buy fiber optic parts and so on. Um, so but, these are people who had the skills themselves absolutely. to build the product. I think. That's critical. A person with an idea to build deep tech, not a good investment. People who can build it themselves, who are builders, yeah, that makes it a lot easier because they don't have to hire yeah. people. Well, we typically need to see some evidence that, yeah, they can get this thing built cheaply within wow. 18 months. So cash efficiency becomes uh, a part of the thesis as well for near future, not... What, did you, what was the term you used? Not science fiction? Or? Science nonfiction. Science nonfiction. <laughs> capital efficiency is going to come into play here. Yeah. Um, and you don't want somebody who's 
on a five year time frame. Fundamental R and you know, fundamental R and D or fundamental science is 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 not something we that we typically can do, you know, on venture yeah. timelines basically. No. And and you often don't need to. Like you can you can stand on the infrastructure that's been built through mobile internet software etc um people aren't kind of um you know inventing things from scratch a lot of the time these days yeah they're standing on somebody's shoulders yep. it's just a matter of whose yes and if you look at oculus which some people think, oh my god this is a deep tech company it was like well there was a lot going on with screens and if people don't remember like you know some of the first vr concepts were well we now have mobile screens and mobile batteries yeah that are capable of putting on your head yes uh and you know <laughs> yeah that's a that's a really good example so yeah, and, yeah we need to miniaturization see of miniaturization of components that yep. were led by mobile uh, the government here is not quite as dysfunctional as our government at the moment <laughs> in terms of geopolitical and the and the, mm. and the trump chaos uh you know problems but you have a government that from my assessment is not startup friendly to the extent it is in the United States. In the United States, we allow a little more risk taking, I think, um, syndicates come to mind, uh, SPVs, just a little more fluidity. Talk a little bit about the regulatory environment for startups here and what needs to improve. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably important to like make the distinction between the rhetoric and what, what is publicly said and then and the actual yes. legislative environment. There are certainly areas we could improve on. I mean, immigration is a really big one, like talent is an issue we should be doing everything we can to make it easy for really talented people to come to this country now and you we... have a point system yes is that right like canada y yeah can not you that familiar with canada system, yeah they have a yes. point system as yeah. well explain just broad strokes if you can yeah uh, no, i didn't bring you on talking about immigration but what what that means and then where you see it breaking down and you know maybe working against uh or not being a competitive advantage or a detriment to the startup community yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, the, the main differentiator, I guess, with the US is that we don't have this lottery system where, you know, you could just be lucky and, and, and turn up, yeah. you know, getting a visa to Australia. Typically, um, we have different programs, the higher skilled visa program is the one I kind of see most in, in it relevant to startups where, you um, you know, there are a certain number of visas allocated to people who have degrees in certain areas or have experience in certain areas who can demonstrate that um, a local uh, technology company really needs their services and, you know, can theoretically fast track their applications. That's probably where most of the complaint is, is just like- Define fast slow. track. Are we talking about a month or a year? I've seen upwards of a year, which is like the really probably disappointing part. But we'll start um, out of business by then. Oh, absolutely. They have yeah. Or runway. even more ludicrously, I've yeah. seen some startups like contract workers overseas while they wait for these applications to maybe be approved. I'm kind of like, it'd be really great to have that salary taxed in this country rather than. Yeah, that uh, is paradoxical. <laughs> it's like we're yeah. we're going to ship money to yeah. Singapore or Tokyo yeah, or yeah. the United States or New Zealand, wherever it is. Yeah. And cost this country yeah. the tax revenue yeah. or the velocity of that money being spent on lunches, dinners, furniture, you know, going out and about, hiring yeah. nannies, whatever it is, the trickle down or monetary sure. velocity that high tech salaries create for a community. And look, look, I mean, the tax is one part, but then there's just the training aspect as well. Mm. Like we just need to attract these people with experience who can help huh. us, you know, uh, upskill our, our own our own population. But I mean, aside from immigration, there is a lot of good stuff that the government does here. I think the R&D tax credit is a big one. Mm. You know, this is one where you can get like almost 50 cents in the dollar that you spend on R&D. Uh, you know, refunded to you from the government. You used a little air quote there on R&D. Yeah. <laughs> the R&D definition, if you're working on, uh, my understanding is if you're working on something that's not going to market immediately, that would be R&D. So if we're working on version three of a product, maybe, and you have one no, in the no, market? No, no, it's, it it, it's broader than that. And, and, and look, this is an area that really needs to be clarified by ah, the government. Um, because in the past, I think people have been a bit too liberal. It's kind of like every line of code is not, is not true R and D, but Got it's it. sort of new, new features, new mm. new new bits of work. So, it. um, and, and and it's really important to document that and to know what you're doing up front. But you know, the headline is still free money for startups. Yeah. Um, and we also have pretty great um grant um grant um programs as well. I mean, you've probably heard, you know, Canva. I think was a great recipient of like about 1.6 million. Non dilutive. Yeah, non dilutive. 
just and and really at the early stage when when it's and think super- about how many hundreds of jobs that created totally and if it created just 10 jobs that lasted 10 years and each year that person paid fifteen thousand dollars in taxes or spent fifteen thousand dollars in pubs and restaurants and buying yeah. stuff it would be a break-even proposition for the government yeah. so what a huge win and canva created much more yeah. than uh, that in terms of value, let alone totally. the venture returns for your LPs and other LPs here that would then reinvest in the next crop of companies. Yes. So th- those are just, you know, really great uh, advantages you do have here. Yeah. And I think the the third thing that um, uh, they do well is we have a program um, called the Early Stage Venture Capital Limited Partnership Program, which offers tax-free returns mm-hmm. for investors in funds like Blackbird. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to have to slow you down here because... This sounds quite appealing. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a I wonderful am a, program. I'm a citizen of Australia. Resident even. Oh, yum, yum. You guys are trying <laughs> to recruit j <J-Cal? laughs> So I moved to Sydney. Yep. I put a million dollars into Blackbird Ventures 3. Yep. It turns you 10x my money. I have a $9 million game. What happens? Um, provided all those companies. I mean, there's there's uh, the highlight, the high level answer is you don't pay any tax on on those returns oh my yum yum yeah so so but they have to be some percentage of those dollars have to be invested here yeah that that, that and that's a you can invest up to 20 percent of your capital in foreign companies Got it. that actually in reality turns out to be much less around 10 percent, but that's fine yeah um it, it's still you know, greatly stimulating the growth of the industry here. Um, oh and, and to your point, that capital gets recycled into the system and uh, into more funds and, and more successful companies. What do you love about this job? Because you've worked as a service provider, uh, as an attorney, you've worked building the product. Uh, you seem delighted with this career <laughs> uh, based on my experience. Uh, we've known each other now for two years. Uh, or going into our second year. What is it that you love about investing in startups? Well, I mean, I love the breadth of ideas, problems, markets that you get to learn about. I mean, just this year alone, we literally looked at neural computing companies, 3D cell printing, uh, clean meat, cell-based meat companies, SaaS, rockets, etc. But what's even more awesome is the people behind those stories. Typically when we invest, it's literally two, three people, uh, a little bit of product, a really big vision, big ambition. And you get to be a really small part of that journey um, that they go on. I mean, so many people talk about the things they're going to do and complain about what is. I get to spend my whole day with people who are doing something about it. It is so delightful in an age of people complaining and being victims and being outraged and depressed to just hang out with the people who, you know, they're trying. Speaking, they're just trying. They're just know? trying and yeah. they're blocking that out and saying, yeah, let's just get to work. Let's roll up our sleeves. Yeah. How, how might it work? You know? Yeah. How might we fix this? Yeah. In, instead of complaining about it or being depressed about it, <laughs> let's take some action. Uh, you mentioned neural computing or interfaces. Explain what that is to the audience that doesn't know uh, what that is. So um, so this is basically, instead of classical computing, running electrical circuits, using the electrical circuits essentially in neurons to uh, process information. The idea being like that this is much less energy intensive than classical computing and also a lot faster. And there are some people who believe, and I am not expert enough to comment on yeah, whether sure. they're right or not, um, that uh, uh, certain general AI may never be possible unless we have something like neural computing. Um, it, Some quantum leap in computing power. Yes. Which could be quantum computing. It, it might or be. Or it could be biological computing is what we're talking about here. Yes, correct. Yeah. And and the idea that being um, some areas of human intelligence, like creativity, um, linguistics, I think is sometimes put in this category as well, require sub- such abstract connections mm. that it's not purely mathematical power. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's something else. Yeah. It is interesting to see AI be sprinkled on top of every startup we see, <laughs> food delivery powered by AI. or Yeah. So what are your thoughts and how do you distinguish if a startup actually is AI powered 
or they're sprinkling the machine learning AI fairy dust on top of it. I think what we're, we're trying to like sort of dig into, okay, um, what exactly is the step change here? What are the AI technologies you're actually using? Who in the team here has that data research, data science yeah. background? And I think much more importantly even is um, – Where's the like? Where's the data that you're going to train your algorithms from, mm. or, or, or what's the evidence that your algorithms already are a step change better than yeah. um, the status quo? Um, th and most companies don't actually that that claim to be AI don't actually have great answers for yeah. how they're going to get that cold start training data. Um, I love that answer answered. because every company is just sprinkling AI on it, and a lot it's of it's blockchain. Yeah, it was like blockchain <laughs> last year, and it, when you look at it, it. I, my first response when they say they're doing AI or they're adding machine learning is, okay, who on the team is doing that? And boy, does sometimes you say like, yeah, well, we're, we're researching into it. We're looking into it. We, we're, we have an open position we for that. We and DeepMind and Facebook and La 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 are trying to hire those people to do that for yeah, us. And they're, and they're <laughs> offering them salaries that would be the entirety of your round yeah, of funding. Exactly. So if, if you could attract them. If you them. could attract them, and you might, you know, if they're truly passionate about it. Absolutely. The crypto craze seemed to uh, land here pretty heavily. Last year when I was here, it's gone now. Uh, it seems to have... Um, well, I think the errors come out of crypto generally in a yeah. lot of places. So, Is that correct? And what did you think when you saw ICOs and companies selling tokens that did not exist yet to investors who had never invested before, who were sending money to wallets of people they'd never met in person. What was your assessment as a professional investor <laughs> when that phenomenon was going on and people were putting pressure on people like us to have a crypto thesis or strategy? Mm -hmm. Did you participate? Did you get FOMA? What was your reaction to the, to the madness 18 months ago? Oh, it's a really big question. Um, we have actually um, done some investments in crypto, but this was actually, you know, preceded all this craze. This was like 2013, 2014. Okay, we did when a, it was legitimate technology. And, yeah, yeah. Um, Were you investing in tokens or companies? Companies, equity. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. And and um, and the performance of those companies have almost entirely kind of depended on the price of of Bitcoin and and yep. and, and and that. So you know, but that, I mean, that has been a fascinating journey. I guess what I would say is we have haven't really been involved since then and pr largely it's because they sort of seem to be a lot of the companies we've seen like fail on startup 101 stuff have you validated the problem have you talked to customers uh well, you know have those customers you know validated that you're building something of value does this market even exist uh it is amazing when you think about the delusion that occurred that people were able to write a white paper with spelling errors and grammatical yeah. errors in it saying, here are some obvious statements about the world. We have yet to talk to customers, but we believe that this blockchain or immutable blockchain proof of stake will <laughs> take down Canva, Uber, and Atlassian. And you're like, but you don't have any customers. You haven't talked to them. There's not a single product that has come out. Has, is there a single product besides store of value and money transfer that has come out of this I, I, that you've seen yeah. that you were so compelled by? No, and I, like not that I'm aware of. And I think the main thing is, is like, you know, at that early stage comes back to team. You know, do you really want to invest in the team that don't want to talk to their customers, that don't don't want to build the product first, that kind of want to raise all the money but not do the like the actual work of delivering on the oh, vision? It's a bit of a um, tell, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, it's just like not how we would like to spend our time. We want to spend our time with people who love to build product and delight customers. Uh, if you are doing everything you can to raise money and not do that, <laughs> it's, it's, we're probably not a fit. Yeah. To me, that was the ultimate tell. We want the money and we want unlimited amounts of money. There's no cap on it. There's no protections for the investors. No. It was an extraordinary turn of events. I found one product that I was super compelled by, and it sounds like a joke. The one I thought this is the perfect application was a company called CryptoKitties, which I don't know if you heard Bill about. Tai yeah, is, I think yeah, Bill Tai yeah, was yeah, involved yeah. in it. Yeah. yeah. So CryptoKitties, for people who don't know, was, hey, you could buy and sell a cat, a digital cat or a, a digital object. Now, this seems silly until you consider trading cards, art, Tamagotchi, Tamagotchi you know. uh, and other digital assets in video games, et cetera. And that, my gosh, if there are a limited number of these digital assets and you could trade them freely um, and even create smart contracts between them. 
my mind was like, well, this actually is something that an artist would be very interested in. And if you talk to 10 artists and said, you made this beautiful painting and it's object of art, and you're gonna sell it to me for $100, you're starting your career. But I will give you, as part of the contract, if you sell it to me for 100, the ability to receive 20% of the next two transactions that occur. So mm. when I sell it to another person, they mm. must agree to give you 20% when they sell it, if they sell it, mm. in the next 100 years. And I will give you 20% of the sale if I sell it. Yeah. Uh, how would that sound to you? And what Ca 10 compelling. out of 10 would yeah. be like, yes. Yeah. So that to me is smart contracts is just so brilliant. Yeah. Well, I'm not dissing the technology at all. In fact, yeah. a lot of the things is like, oh, that makes sense. The world should work that way. But what we do know about startups is that uh, humans are pretty irrational a lot of the time. They don't always buy the thing that they should that yeah. is good for them, et cetera. And um, we just need to know that up front before we, we put some money in. Yeah. I mean, if you think about Betamax and versus VHS or mini disc versus CD, <laughs> like the mini disc from Sony was digital, yep. recordable. The CD was not. Yep. The mini disc was smaller, was more stable. I mean, yep. it was like there's so many much better aspects to a mini disc than a CD. Yep. Yet Sony spent billions trying to make that work and they couldn't. Yeah, I mean, crazy. talk to sort of 99% of fitness apps, you know, like humans are irrational. They don't do the things that they they should do that are good for them. And, yeah. you know, yeah, it's just. Tell me about the one that got away. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, so uh, there is a unicorn in Australia called Air Wallex. Um, Air Wallex. Yes. Um, it's in the it's in the payments and cur currency space. Mm. Um, it sort of fell within our era of operation. So we got started in, in 2011, 2012, by the, t by the time, you know, uh, we actually started raising the fund. Um, so technically, and it is and it is serving global customers. So technically it does fit into our mandate. I think we got caught out because we don't do FinTech because so often it is Australia only, Australia focused, mm. and we're so global focused that we kind of got blinded by the headline that it was in payments and currency and, and, and figured, you know, at that early stage that it probably wasn't in our mandate and 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 you know didn't uh didn't meet, meet the company and didn't take it up and it's turned out to be a fantastic success story with an absolutely phenomenal founding team it's based in melbourne so i think that one was a clear miss i think for us have you seen what what do you take away from that i'm curious um because that's part of what we do is like try to fix the leaks in our game as investors yeah. when we make these mistakes have you have you tried to fix that leak? Do you carry it with you forward? Um, I wouldn't say this was directly in response to that one, but that one was, like, I mean, a cold email as well, which we actually got back to. Oh, my um, Lord. So and, that and makes so, it doubly painful. Yeah. yeah I've, Somebody sent you a cold email, yeah. which you get an unlimited number of. You responded to a cold email that turned into a unicorn. Yeah. And didn't make the investment. Yes. As painful as it gets, I believe. Yeah. The only more painful scenario would be a friend of yours saying, <laughs> would you like to buy some shares of Tesla at a dollar? And not doing it, which is what happened to me with Elon. Which, oh. <laughs> like, I'm not an angel investor. Yeah, I don't really do that uh, angel investing thing. But, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know. It, if we're just you know too zen about it like i mean they have gone on to be phenomenally successful raise money from uh, other funds in the market such as square peg so, you're happy um, for them. so we're happy for them and yeah, you're we're happy with our we're, yeah. we're we're happy with you know our fund performance like we yeah. have lots of wonderful companies i highly so. recommend you do not get comfortable i would yeah. i would say be bitter, be bitter well i think what I'm we joking. have done <laughs> no what we have done is um what is clear about that company is we were wrong about our hypothesis about mm. them being australia only we should have dug deeper and the second thing is that is an amazing team and and some teams mm. are anti-gravitational well well we we, ha we have since refined our process to uh you know, get better or higher fidelity on email or, or through the cold email funnel um, on, on whether these are potentially really amazing people. Ah, is there a metric you can share or an internal slogan or device heuristic? I know it's competitive advantage and that's why I'm asking because I would like it myself. <laughs> how do you assess exceptional founders? I have some ideas too, I'll share mine. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah. I mean, we have a bunch of questions that we sort of internally ask ourselves and yeah. ask each other. Um, uh, unstoppable force is one of them. Are they an unstoppable force? Would I work for the founder? Oh, great test. What is what is um, the evidence or what's the data that they're going to be a magnetic um, attractor for talent? You can usually see that right at the beginning. Um, we have another term, uh, cliff mongrel which is after Cliff Obrecht, one of the co-founders of Canva, he just has 
this street fighter ability to kind of so that grit cut doggedness yeah. yeah yeah absolutely so there's just these all these little little things and it's just, it's so hard it's Mm. you you intuitively know it when when you sort of see it but th those questions can be very clarifying i like to look at product velocity these days mm. um over while i'm in that month or week weeks to months sometimes even quarters of getting to know a founder do i see some growth or improvement in them the team the product the metrics communication yeah the deck, I mean, all of these things can improve over yeah. time. And that's what I love about running the Launch Accelerator is I get to spend 12 weeks with them. If in that 12 weeks they take the work seriously and I see them improve, the ones that improve the most, I give a preemptive 750,000 yeah. to a million dollar, a mil, yeah. which was, I give them a mil offer <laughs> to say, hey, yeah, you know, we'll lead the round or we'll take the whole round. Because I've seen over the last, last 12 weeks, undeniable, evi undeniable evidence of product velocity and executive improvement, yep. you know, leadership improvement, because yep. it can happen in such a short period of time. Absolutely. Yeah. How, how they respond in response to success or to to, to positive uh, feedback is a really big input. It's just even asking, answering questions better or having a dialogue. Yep. What are your thoughts on difficult people? We'll, we'll kind of wrap up here. Um, a lot of people, when I meet them in their, in their early stages of becoming an investor, well, this person's too difficult and they don't invest or, I hear some of the times the older investors, yeah, the, this person was too easygoing or this person was so difficult I had to invest. How do you think about the, the, the great investments and maybe sometimes being a little iconoclastic, difficult, headstrong? I think it really depends on the business they're building. Okay. Some businesses, I think, really require Require that sort of go through brick walls kind of tenacity, um, almost you know apathetic attitude to to naysayers and so on. Um, provided they also are balanced with that, like I said, the magnetic quality. Can they attract the right people? If they're just difficult in the sense that you don't want to work with them, but neither does anybody else. That's, that's a, a non-starter. <laughs> that's a non-starter. Yeah. You can't really build a company of one. Like they're, they're difficult and headstrong enough to ignore the naysayers, but not so difficult and headstrong to not be able to attract talent and repel Absol people. Absolutely. Which we do see at times. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to yeah. please everybody, but boy, do you need to please the people who choose to come on the yeah. the journey with you. And look, some also sometimes people have reasons for being difficult. Some people have had bad experiences with investors and are potentially uh, painting you with the same brush. And, you know, you can spend some time to get to know whether that is like, you know, whether you can convince them that you're different and you can have a different uh, relationship and reset. Yeah, you've had that experience, I take it. Or I've met a few people yeah. where, I, where I can see that that's what's happened. Yeah, there's an anti-venture movement in the United States. It's very small, but the press seems to really like harp on it. I think it's an, a nice headline to get clicks on this anti VC movement. In almost every case, there's a bunch of VCs at the core of it who are <laughs> doing this sort of slow VC or zebras or maybe don't give too many controls. So you see that here are people or are people generally positive on the venture community. I think I've seen people's attitudes change. Mm. Um, I think uncompetitive markets, uh, you know, invite uh, or, or allow bad behavior to exist. And I think you could have said that about the last decade mm. um, of some behavior of not just VCs, but, but but sort of investors all painted with the same brush. I think we're in a different era now. I think uh, pretty much all the VCs in Australia, um, uh, you know, Re recognize that being founder friendly or being you know founder focused uh having very standard clean terms etc um and aligning your interests with founders is ultimately how we all win um so i'd say that you know that sentiment of like uh don't trust investors is is on the decline yeah it's very interesting we in silicon valley we've always had these sort of clean terms and you know maybe 30 or 20 30 years ago when i was first getting the industry in the 90s you had this idea that the VCs, because of the 80s hangover, would replace the founder. That was just basically like Cisco's founders will be replaced <laughs> by professional management. Yep. And then that changed, I think, in the 90s, and people realized, well, no, you know, after what happened with Steve Jobs, mm. like, look, you, know, yep. you really, you know. Sometimes the founder is the right person to run the Yeah, exactly, and yeah. If, even if you don't see eye to eye with the founder or they're iconoclastic mm. or 
you know, in his case, you know, abrasive, maybe in his earlier days to some people, um, uh, you know, it, it's for the better if you can make it work with the founder. And then we still see that actually in America and other cities where on the East Coast, I'm perplexed sometimes where people are arguing over the interest rate in a convertible note. And I had to say to one investor, you know, that's not why we're investing. If we wanted to have a you're different a series G investor or something and you're possibly pre -IPO tape, maybe. Yeah. But like if we're going to get if you're going to get two, four or six percent on a note that converts in the next two years on a 25K or 10K investment, you realize this is de minimis and you, you actually there's better the time move on <laughs> yeah, there's better vehicles for that you could get um, municipal bonds in the united states that are tax free at four yeah. percent why are you doing this you don't have to talk to anybody you don't have to fill out any paperwork or have a lawyer you could just do that with your charles schwab account or whatever it is yeah why is financial services so strong here um i noticed there's like a large number of financial services startup or is that just uh, fintech startups fintech oh, yeah. Well, well yeah because i mean it's, I think Australian banks are, I mean, the four major ones mm. and they are some of the most profitable banks in the world, I think. Maybe too of, profitable, I understand. Well, uh, that's, the 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 that's the theory, right? And that's yeah. that's encouraging a lot of startups to uh, attack mm. it at, at all the sides. And um, and yeah, fintech has been actually very, very successful in the last six, seven years in, in Australia and creating value. All right, well, listen, Sam, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, especially considering <laughs> you're uh, uh, you know, about to have a, a baby in another couple of weeks. Um, and thanks so much for being supportive of us uh, and Launch and our team here while we're in um, for Sydney. Yeah, it's been great. I, it really is. Um, you know, we've been looking at other markets. Our, the core premise that we have in our firm is never underestimate anyone. Yeah. And boy, have we been proven right in this market. Like it, it really... I think a lot of people underestimated what's going on here because of the time difference and the, and the distance. <laughs> it's just easy to be like, well, you don't that... need to get in a time machine. It's just a it's no, it's just flight. a flight. And yeah. it, it goes pretty quick, and there's yeah. direct ones. And boy, you know, Canva and Atlassian have really changed people's thinking. Mary Meeker, uh, you know, one of the most recognizable mm. thinkers in tech over the last two or three decades, you know, with their new fund, her first investment, Canva. Yeah. At two and a half billion dollars, she put in 85 million, I believe, or maybe there was some pro rata in there from other people, but that is a big vote of confidence, is it not? Yes, I mean, we're delighted and- um, and, and she came here to pursue them, is my yes. understanding. Yeah, well, lots of firms, lots of firms did, it was very competitive. Oh, they all flew down here to court them. How, how yeah, I mean- That's amazing. Yeah. When you think about it, because she was coming to meet with Bill Tai, she told me, to try to get something going in America Basically told them like I'm going to be in America. Can I meet with you? You said Australia. I might be able to... No, she came to oh, right. America. Oh right. And told him I'm in America oh, next week. About, oh, so you're talking about Mel now? I thought you were talking about Mel. Mel Mika. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah the other, correct. Yeah. Melanie yes. said to Bill Tai, she told this great story. He said, Yeah, if you're ever in America, look me up. And he, she said, I'm in America next week. Yeah. She wasn't. She was just like, let's Hustling. take a shot and yeah. see, let's hustle. And he's like, yeah, sure, I got 20 minutes for you. And she yeah. flew to America to meet with him for 20 minutes. Well, what's really awesome is we don't really, I mean, you know, now funds are much happier to come here and invest from, you know, Series A onwards. Mm. Um, and we, you know, hope to be the trusted partner locally here for those firms. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really great bridge that's being built and um, continued success to uh, you and your team at Blackbird Ventures. Uh, and we will see you all next time on... Angel, the podcast.